Hello and welcome back everybody to another episode in this FS Academy Commander series. Today we are taking on episode number two, Sub-Zero. I have a feeling we're going to get pretty iced up in this one, so let's jump in. Flight icing is a serious business. The accumulation of ice on the various controls, intakes and instrumentation of our aeroplane presents a range of issues and harmful effects, which the commander needs to be able to recognize and respond to. It's a cold winter's day above the Isle of Man, with ground temperatures of around minus four degrees centigrade. Air temperature drops by around 2 degrees centigrade for every 1,000 feet we climb, so increasing our altitude will likely worsen any icing. Looking at our temperature probe, we see a reading of minus 9 degrees. We're going to encourage ice formation to learn the symptoms to look out for and what countermeasures we should employ. Remain at 2,500 feet and fly northeast, following the coastline en route to Ramsey. Our altimeter and vertical speed indicator, VSI, are both pressure instruments, supplied with outside air pressure via the static ball. Like temperature, air pressure reduces with height in a very predictable way, which is displayed on the pressure instruments with very high accuracy. The airspeed indicator, ASI, is also a pressure instrument, but with two sources. In addition to the static port, it is also supplied by the pitot tube. The pitot tube points forwards and receives the pressure of the oncoming airflow, known as ram air. By subtracting the static air pressure from the ram air, we get dynamic pressure, which the ASI displays as indicated airspeed. Icing forms on sharp, forward-facing parts first, so our pitot tube is susceptible to icing. We prevent this with pitot heat, which is currently turned on. The switch is located behind your yoke. Please hide the yoke so that we can get a better view of the switches. Alrighty. Please turn off the pitot heat and let's see what happens. You heat off. Like the rest of the aircraft, the pitot tube is now being cooled by the sub-zero airflow. Combined with the moisture in the air, this will form as ice, blocking the intake. See how our ASI now shows zero. Ice is stopping any ram air from entering the tube, so only static pressure remains, just like our altimeter and VSI. We no longer have an airspeed indication, so we'll need to go back to basics and use pitch and power references. Please now start a climb, applying full power and raising the nose to put the engine cowling on the horizon. Hold this attitude as we continue to climb and expect to re-trim as we slow from cruising speed to climb speed. As the air pressure outside drops, the altimeter and VSI show a climb. Let's now see what happens if the static port also becomes blocked. See how our ASI, VSI and altimeter are all completely still. Because of our pitch and power setting, we know that we are climbing, but we don't see that on our instrumentation. This is scary. As the static port is the only contact with the outside world for the altimeter, a blockage causes the indications to stop and remain frozen at whatever altitude was shown at the time of the blockage. Whilst the VSI stops working, as it can no longer detect any changes in pressure, to restore static pressure to our instruments, we can use an alternative static source, usually selected by pulling a control in the cockpit. We 
pilot if that fails or is not available for your aeroplane, we have another more extreme option. I'm going to smash the glass on the VSI. This will allow ambient pressure to return to the static system in exchange for a broken VSI. So we now have a broken VSI, but at least we have an altimeter and the static supply to our airspeed indicator is restored. Now level off at 4,000 feet, remembering to disregard the VSI and continue towards Ramsey. You can now turn the pitot heat back on to recover your ASI. Okay, pitot heat back on. The pitot tube will now be heated, melting away any ice present, which will run out of the drain hole as water. Keep following the coast towards Ramsey. There we go. All right, let's start heading back. Please turn back towards the airport. Well, yeah, we'll do. As we have been flying in icing conditions, we have been accumulating ice in other areas. Just like in a car, our engine has an air filter to keep dust and debris from reaching the cylinders. Ice has also accumulated on this filter and in the intake, restricting the airflow into the engine, reducing our power. The engine has been working hard for some time now, so it is putting out a lot of heat. This heat helps to keep the engine bay and air intakes free from ice, but let's see what happens if we reduce power in the descent. Pull the throttle all the way back to idle and start descending towards 2,500 feet. Hey, throttle going to idle. The engine is now starting to cool, and with it we lose some of its anti-icing benefits. Notice the green arc on the RPM gauge. When the power is below this arc in flight, it is recommended that we turn on the carburetor heat. This recirculates some of the hot air from the exhaust back into the intake, warming the carburetor and helping to keep it clear of ice. Pull the carb heat handle fully out to activate it. Running the engine on warm air does reduce its performance, but keeping the intake clear of ice is worth the temporary reduction in power. Keep descending and level off at 2,500 feet. Again, remember that the VSI is no longer usable. Okay, about 600 feet to go. Something's wrong. Level the wings with rudder, but be gentle with the controls. Well done. Use whatever rudder input you need to stop any roll and keep the wings level. Just try to avoid full deflection on the I think our ailerons have become frozen. Use the rudder to control roll, and we'll look at what's going on here. We're trying to roll using the ailerons, but they're frozen solid. Let's look at the secondary effects of our controls. Each of the main flight controls have a primary and a secondary effect. For example, moving the ailerons primarily causes a rolling motion. This is followed by the secondary effect of yaw. The opposite is also true where using the rudder primarily causes yaw, with roll as the secondary effect. Try and gently use the rudder to roll as left, turning as south. Wow. Great, now level the wings again. 
Is, I've never done this before. It's cool. Good, that seems to work. Use only modest bank angles, as we may be unable to pull out of a very steep turn with rudder alone. We can change our bank angle with careful use of the rudder. It will be an unusual and cumbersome way to fly, but things are looking up. Turn us to the right, heading back towards the airport again. Wow, flying with just rudder is very we have weird. responded to our loss of roll control and established an alternative. This is the aviate stage of dealing with a problem. Isle of Man Ronaldsway Airport isn't much further ahead, so we are flying towards a safe place. This is our navigate stage of failure management. Start descending now towards 1,000 feet as we will be planning to land at the airport. Okay. If we are to land at Ronald's Way, we must contact ATC. This is our communicate stage. This is clearly a serious predicament, so we will declare an emergency with a Mayday call to Ronald's Way Tower. Mayday, 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 Gulf Foxtrot Sierra Alpha Charlie, severe roll control problem due to ice, 2,500 feet descending south of Douglas, request approach and landing. Gulf Foxtrot Sierra Alpha Charlie, Ronald's Way Tower, Mayday acknowledged, runway 26 is in use, state your aircraft type and POB. Cessna 152 with two POB, Golf Alpha Charlie. Golf Alpha Charlie, Roger. Straight in approach, runway 26. We will inform the fire service. Descend at your discretion. Straight in 26, Golf Alpha Charlie. Great, we are cleared by ATC to descend and make an approach to runway 26 for a straight in landing. That's ideal. Uh, okay. Descend towards the airport and line up with the center line of runway 26 straight ahead. In the POH, we find the inadvertent icing encounter checklist. Let's try that. Peter Heat is on. Carpeat is on. Flaps do not use. The icing may be affecting the flaps also, so we want to leave them alone. There is no guarantee that they would deploy symmetrically, which would further burden our roll control. As our aircraft has severe ice secretion, the lift from the flaps may overwhelm the elevator, so we will land flapless. The checklist continues with approach speed 65 to 75 knots. So we will come into land at a slightly higher airspeed to account for the increased weight, lack of flaps and less efficient airflow. Get established at our approach speed now of 70 knots. Okay, now establish on the runway center line. Okay. We're on the center line now. Keep us lined up and land on runway 26. Golf Alpha Charlie cleared to land runway 26. Fire service are alerted. Advise if able to vacate the runway. Clear to land runway 26. We will come to a stop and assess Golf Alpha Charlie. Ooh, slipping too much. With the flapless landing, you'll need a higher nose attitude than usual and will find it hard to slow down. Yep. You will also likely need to flare less than normal. Land on runway 26 and come to a stop on the runway. It's very hard to stay towards the center with uh, just using this rudder. Hard to tell what the pappies are saying. I think it's 
saying I'm low. But actually, they're not saying anything. It's hard to see what they are. A little faster than probably I should be. Made it. We made it. Well Ooh. done. We're starting to bring in the concepts of aviate, navigate, and communicate, and we'll increase focus as we progress. Next time we fly after nightfall and we will start to build your decision-making framework where you will have to consider our options and come to a decision. Mm, got an A on that one. I'll take it. Well, all right, folks, that was fun. It was a little nerve wracking, especially having to uh, control with pretty much just my rudders, never done that before so but hey we got her down all right thanks for watching along see you on the next one